Ocean. Thank you very much. So welcome to today's lecture, which is called Unmuting the Language of My Body Through Fitness. Our speaker today is Ashley Gibb. She is a trauma-informed personal trainer and CrossFit coach that has a passion to facilitate healing and restoration for survivors for survivors of sexual trauma and human trafficking. She has spent the past year living and working with survivors while creating a curriculum that integrates spirituality and fitness for survivors to walk through, work through their trauma and take agency over their bodies. My personal connection with Ashley is that um, Ashley was one of my very first students at um, Waverley Abbey College, where she was doing her master's um, degree in spiritual formation. And um, during that time, I was in the middle of my PhD, um, which is, of course, finished now. And I was discussing muted group theory with her. And then when it came to her dissertation and her time in um, California, working at this specific center, she began to explore beauty group theory a little bit more, and she finished her dissertation with a distinction. This is Ashley's very first public lecture on the topic, um, and I hope it will be one of many. Um, for those of you who don't know muted group theory, you can go back to the OCMS website and look at the past lectures that we've had on muty group theory, um, that looks at different ways of shifting perspective, of deconstructing templates to allow voices and ideas that have not been heard, that are not publicly acknowledged, perhaps, to allow them to be heard, to express and to understand the feelings from other positions and other perspectives. So without any further ado, I will ask Ashley to continue with her talk. Thank you, Usha. I appreciate it. Okay, so um, a little bit about who I am. As Usha said, I am a, a trauma-informed fitness coach. Um, I have worked with clients for about 13 years. And when I first um, stepped into a gym, I was presented with women who had been through sexual trauma um, and then subsequently gained a passion for women who have been through all kinds of trauma. I then went overseas to Thailand and I spent five years working in anti-human trafficking um, and then realized that all these programs have been put on for women um, and guys as well. And yet nobody was really talking about the effect that trauma had on the body and how the body and the mind are so connected. A little bit about myself. So I have my own story of trauma. So I just wanted to obviously give a little bit of a trigger warning for this talk. I am going to be talking about sexual trauma and human trafficking. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit sensitive. But as part of my own journey, um, I am a survivor of trauma myself. So when I went into this work and when I went into this research, I realized that whilst this was my story, it may not be the same for everybody else. And my research could be true for some people, but it may not be true for others. But something I was seeing is that um, we were addressing a lot of trauma via the use of talk therapy, via the use of medication. And whilst I'm an advocate for all of those things, I did feel that the holistic piece was missing from a lot of trauma treatment. For my own self, when I um, started to take agency over my own healing, and started to explore physical fitness, I realized that there was a deep connection between the way that I treated my body and the connection that I had with the Holy Spirit. I began to see the image of God in me more and more as I started to take my own personal health and fitness. And I've been to counseling therapy for years. And whilst all of that was amazing, it was when I started to incorporate movement that I really started to. Um, yeah, to really kind of claim my healing. So I wanted to explore this phenomenon to see what was happening. So I took this to Thailand and I started to train women in exercise and fitness. I started to get them under barbells and to see the transformation that would happen and the door for spiritual conversations um, and just, yeah, 
something really, really powerful happened when we started an exercise program. So I moved to California. I moved into a safe house and started to research this and to understand what was going on. So I created a fitness that was around spirituality and um, fitness and took it through the women because I realized that as much as I was training them in health and wellness, I wanted them to understand the why for themselves. Um, and again, what I saw was something really, really powerful. So that's what I'm going to talk a, a little bit about today. So um, as Usha said, you guys, I think have talked about muti group theory. So I just wanted to give a small breakdown of what it was. So we've got a little bit of background context. So it's a theory that is created by Edwin and Shirley Ardner in 1975. And it explores how marginalized groups are muted and excluded through the use of language um, by a group that is considered the dominant group or culture. So an example of this would be women working in male dominated spaces, different ethnicities or cultures entering into a predominantly white evangelical church, differently abled or disabled uh, people operating in spaces that are set up for able bodied people, queer people entering into predominantly heteronormative churches, and the focus group that I'm going to be looking at is survivors of human trafficking and how I believe that they um, experience this. So uh, muted group theory is geared towards language. So there is a focus on uh, exclusive language that is used by dominant cultures, which creates an us and them perspective. So it's not typically very inclusive and it does not seek equality with groups that are different. So the premise of muted group theory is that members of marginalized groups would mute themselves without coercion. So there's a subtlety in what happens. And when muting occurs, it's not always obvious that this is happening. It's almost like, um, like a shape shifting and those that are being muted end up muting themselves without being aware of it. And this is exactly what I see with survivors who even go through their healing, they go into programs, um, they go to churches, they seek healing from the trauma, but when they enter back into society, there is still a muting that happens by people such as churches or um, healthcare and things like that. And, it, and it's really, really subtle that, that you'd almost don't notice it. So um, Linda Lee Smith Bartman says the language created and the terms defined to describe the life experiences of the dominant group are not therefore adequate to describe the life experiences of the subordinate group. So the marginalized are therefore left feeling more outcast they end up changing their language because everybody ultimately wants to belong. Everybody wants to get a sense of belonging. Um, but there's a difference between belonging and fitting in. So I found this beautiful quote by Brene Brown, who says, the thing is that we are wired to be part of something that is so, uh, oh, I need to move this. We are wired to be part of something bigger than us so deeply that sometimes we will take fitting in as a substitute. But fitting in is the greatest barrier to belonging because fitting in says be like them to be accepted. Belonging says this is who I am. I think that's really, really powerful because the work that I do with women, my heart and my um, yeah, kind of life's work is to empower women, to empower survivors, to find out who God created them to be and to go be that. And I think so many of them after their trauma do try to fit in they try to be normal and they try to fit into what is an acceptable society that they end up kind of cancelling out a lot of their culture or who they are um, and that is not what we want for them oh. okay so uh, i just wanted to talk a little bit about um what human trafficking is so Human trafficking is a commercial sex act that is induced by force, fraud or coercion or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. The recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision or obtaining of a person for labour of services through the use of force, fraud or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage or slavery. So this is, um, th this definition of human trafficking has been broadened. And something that I think is really, really important to understand is that it looks different depending on 
where you are. I think a lot of times we see human trafficking in the media. So we see that it's sensationalized. There are movies that come out like um, you've got Taken. There's recently been a movie come out, which is faith based called The Sound of Freedom. And whilst these are great to a degree because they shine light on human trafficking, what is actually missed is the subtlety of what happens. So um, usually trafficking is actually done by psychological manipulation. So here in the US, most of the women I work with, none of them have been kidnapped, none of them have been abducted or, or chained up. It's all done by subtle manipulation. So a lot of these women um, are trafficked either by their families from such a young age. So it happens within the home um, from about the ages of three to 15. Um, and then uh, some of our women will be in middle school or high school and they'll be very vulnerable. And so they're susceptible to men coming into their lives, grooming them and then selling them for sex. So it's very, very, very subtle, which means that it is harder for a lot of people to break away um, and it 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 really, really, really takes a toll on the body and on the mind. So I've worked in Thailand. I've worked in the UK doing this work. I've worked in the USA. Each country looks vastly different, but the same tactics are used. And it is a muting that happens from the very beginning of their manipulation. Their voices are muted. Their bodies are muted right through to the healing process even the people that are seeking to care for survivors tend to make an assumption of what it is that they need in the healing process without actually hearing their voices. And this can also kind of aid in the muting process. So uh, a really great quote from Joe Biden that just came out in the Trafficking in Persons report. He says, we can't do this work effectively without having the voices, the views, the experiences and the ideas of survivors front and center in everything that we do. So when entering into this work, it's vital to have the voices of the survivors front and center. Having an organization without voices or having survivor-led organizations can result in a failure to serve the needs of the population because we are not listening to them and what they want. So muted group theory and survivors, how this pertains to survivors of trafficking and of sexual trauma. So the, the Polaris Project, which is a big uh, anti-trafficking organization here in the States, they know that the majority of persons who are trafficked are from vulnerable groups such as oppressed or marginal groups, the poor, undocumented migrant groups that are often disproportionately represented by minority and minoritized people of color. So um, when you assume the body to be a product, you're dehumanizing it. Survivors have had dominance placed over them and told that their bodies and their voices are only worth a price tag. So I remember as part of my story, I remember looking in the mirror one day, most of uh, my sexual trauma happened when I was in college um, because I was vulnerable going into college. And I remember looking in the mirror one day and I believed that my body was worth nothing. So as a result of my trauma, my body was numbed through drinking, through drugs and promiscuity. And I did not recognize that the person staring back at me had in fact been muted. I'd muted myself. I'd allowed others to meet me and um, it was painful. So because of that muting, I lost a complete sense of who I was. I did have a faith myself, um, but I didn't believe that because of the trauma that I had been through that I was worth anything and that my body housed the image of God. I kept being told that the image of God was in me. But when I looked in the mirror, I just saw somebody that was broken. The Body Keeps the Score, which we actually just talked about at the beginning of this lecture, um, is an incredible book that if you're interested in trauma healing, I recommend that you all um, get stuck into. It's a beautiful book that was um, written in 2007 by Bessel van der Kolk, who's a psychiatrist. And he was working through um, with veterans of, of combat. And um, he realized that a lot of these veterans that were going through their trauma healing were going into talk therapy and they were finding that they were just being tra re-traumatized over and over and over again. It was reactivating their PTSD. 
And so he came to a place where he he needed to try something different. And he started to do yoga with these veterans, very slow, very steady. Um, But he found that a lot of these um, veterans who were not able to speak about their trauma, when he started to do yoga with them, again, he could see that a lot of stuff was being released for them. And it really, really aided in their trauma. Um, So that's something that we're going to talk a little bit about today, which I have found to be really, really powerful. So uh, muting methods that can happen. So according to scholars Weston Turner, there are four main methods of muting. So these are ridicule, ritual, control and harassment. And we're going to look at these how, as, how it pertains to survivors and victims of trafficking. And then we're going to talk about how fitness can aid in um, unmuting and getting rid of these muting methods. So ridicule, shame, disbelief, trivializing their wants and needs. So this is a really, really huge thing I see um, with survivors. So in the context of Wes and Turner's research, this was relating to the muting of women's voices. Their vocabulary was uh, was ridiculed, their opinions were trivialized and their voices were censored. So this is especially happens with those who are victims of sexual trauma. We see over and over again how often women who've undergone sexual abuse are disbelieved. Their voices are silenced and they're made to feel like it was their fault for the choice of clothes they wear. Um, or for trafficking victims, the abuse is so psychological that they can be shamed for not seeing red flags or staying away from their trafficking situations. When survivors try to speak out against their traffickers, they are again at times disbelieved. When they go into medical settings, their issues are trivialized. And in church, how they experience God through the lens of trauma can be disregarded. They are told to forgive quickly and to see the goodness in what has happened. And I think this is actually um, spiritual gaslighting. I think if we don't give light to survivors trauma, especially in a church setting, which I'm gonna come back to a little bit later, it can actually bypass the trauma and the pain and doesn't allow women to experience the the pain uh, and suffering in their bodies when they go into a church and they're told just to to forgive their, their traffickers quickly and to praise and celebrate what God has done. And I think this can actually do survivors a huge disservice. So ritual, we can see this in the muting in, in church leadership and in church sacraments. Control, uh, the word control can have many different connotations depending on the context. But um For Western Turner, they explore the control through the means of interruption in conversation. Um, When men and women are talking with each other, they can see a lot how men would interrupt men. Uh, They would interrupt women, sorry. And when women, when working with survivors, this can look like making an assumption of their needs and not giving them space to voice what their actual needs are. Can look like spiritual manipulation with survivors who are prone um, to that happening due to their vulnerability. And then harassment, this is a common tactic of those who are trafficking victims. It can start off as something really subtle through psychological manipulation. It's a control tactic used to break someone down and to instill fear. So these are the the muting methods that we typically see with survivors of trafficking. So those that mute, who are the people that mute survivors? So we see this, uh, the traffickers, so they deem their victims as commodities. The church, this is a big one. um, And so um, my organization is a faith-based organization and uh, we are connected with a church. And I think the church is actually, what is beautiful about the church is that um, for most of the organizations who are working in human human trafficking, they are faith based, which I think is incredible that the church is leading the way to reach out to survivors. But actually what I found going into a lot of churches and as a trauma survivor myself, um, I have found that a lot of times it, the theology doesn't, uh, the church itself doesn't create a safe space for survivors to work through their trauma. So Is your church trauma-informed? Does it understand trauma? Is it giving space for survivors to come in? Uh, Because it should be the the safest space on earth. It should be a place that you can come, that you can bring your burdens um, and that you can feel totally safe. And for a lot of survivors, it typically isn't. 
O'Donnell and Cross, who are two prominent um, leaders in something that is quite new called trauma theology, they say, what does our theology do? Does it have the capacity to touch pain or does it bypass it, move about it, or to readily sweep it into an overarching narrative of redemption and victory? So typically what I've heard survivors of trauma express is that many churches do not seek to understand pain and suffering, but they look to bypass it. This mutes the voices and the experiences of those who have suffered at the hands of abuse. Trauma theology, however, seeks to unmute that pain and to hold space for it. So trauma theology and trauma theologians are both seeking to understand people's experiences and to reshape theologies in the light of that experience so that they do justice to the real lives of real people. Furthermore, both trauma theologians and feminist theologians recognize the way in which theologies have been traditionally constructed by those who are less likely to be women and also those less likely to experience trauma. Approaches that have concern for social justice and pay critical attention to ways of knowing, questions of representation and modes of constructing knowledge are common to both, uh, to both feminist and trauma theologies. I found this to be really, really powerful when um, doing my thesis, this concept of trauma theology. Um, and I have since been able to speak to churches to understand what their theology and what they're preaching on a Sunday. Does it give um, space, even in our interpretation of scripture, to recognize trauma and for survivors to be safe? And actually, we're going to look a little bit at the book of Esther in a little bit and how that's interpreted and how actually that is a story of a woman or women that were trafficked at the time, but yet it gets used as this amazing kind of celebration um, of what Esther did, but actually there's a much darker story attached to it. So uh, skipping lament to get to the praise, we've just talked a little bit about this. So I just wanted to read from my thesis um, on this. I think it kind of describes what I'm thinking accurately on this. Um, to kind of give light to this concept of trauma theology. So trauma theology is particularly focused on human experience and how someone's understanding of God can address their suffering. Cross and O'Donnell express frustration at theology that was kind of mentioned this, that, that moves directly to a narrative of redemption and victory instead of sitting in suffering and standing in solidarity with those who experience pain. They also express the importance of remaining in Holy Saturday before leaping to Resurrection Sunday. When working with trafficking survivors, it is detrimental to rush through the healing process and straight to the praise and celebration. Mourning and remembering are important factors in, in recovery, according to Pickle, so that one can experience emotions arising from memories before releasing them and moving into a healthy future. Most of my experiences with the evangelical church are that of a rushed process, which keeps a survivor stuck in her trauma without first addressing it properly. For some survivors, the experience of helplessness, loss of meaning and profound disconnect can occur. As such, the process of remembering and deconstructing their trauma, as well as mourning the loss of the life that they imagined is vital to healing. Spirituality enables the aforementioned process if explored in a healthy and safe way. While spirituality may allow for this processing, the survivor's view of spirituality must be considered. Encouraging doubt and questioning is important when engaging in these types of conversations. Nigan and Bell Humor state that the potential exists for a survivor to develop a sense of inner peace if they explore spirituality for themselves. I think this is really powerful and I think muted group theory uh, can be used here to suggest that the, the church is possibly muting survivors voices. Instead of giving them the space they need to heal and lament, we want to hear the redemption story so it fits into this nice neat box of God's healing power. And whilst that does happen, I think that's amazing to celebrate. How often do we praise God's miracles and we want to hear the stories of healing, but we feel so uncomfortable in just sitting and journeying through someone's pain and suffering. If they're not healed fast, then some of the narratives that I have heard spoken over survivors is that you did not have enough faith. And this is so dangerous and detrimental to a survivor's healing. What would it look like instead to allow the survivor to go at their own pace, to bring their questions, to bring their doubts, 
to bring their anger and frustration at God and to just sit with them in this. When I started taking survivors through exercise, first of all, we would sit on the mat um, and we would just be. I would get and getting a survivor just to be in her own skin is a really, really hard thing to do. And we would just get and we would sit and we would kind of um, talk about what we're feeling. And I would ask them, how do you feel towards God today? A lot of them were numb. A lot of them were angry, frustrated, confused. Most of the survivors I work with want nothing to do with God. And yet, as we have journeyed through this process of exercising and getting into their body and realizing that the body that was created houses the spirit of God the narrative started to change and while there was a frustration and what actually transpired was that there was an anger and frustration at the church because a lot of their trafficking had actually happened in spiritual settings in churches Um, and actually when they came to almost separate that for a time being and they began to, to seek healing in their bodies there was actually this yearning this yearning to understand who God was for them and it was just a really, really, really powerful thing to witness. So um, I talked a little bit about um, the story of Esther and how we see muting within scripture. So typically when I've gone to church with survivors, the narrative that is actually spoken of women in the Bible who engaged in prostitution is actually really disempowering for trauma survivors, especially those who were trafficked, who did not choose this life. Um, the way that women are spoken about in scripture can be um, really, really painful for them to hear. So the story of Esther, um, the Shiloh Project says there are troubling silences in the book of Esther that have been muted and ignored throughout the history of interpretation. So the book of Esther presents the representations of collective trauma in the form of trafficking. So I just wonder how was Esther communicated to you when you came into church? I know for me as a young girl, I was always told to be like an Esther. You know, the story of Esther is this magical story about a woman that saves all the Jews. And again, Esther was an incredible woman. What she did was amazing, but actually her story is one of human trafficking. This verse here um, in Esther 2 says, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint commissioners in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in the citadel of Susa under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetic treatments be given them and let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. So when people talk about the book of Esther, this part seems to get brushed over. The story is glamorized and it's interpreted in a way that suggests God caused this to happen. Are we muting Esther's voice here? Are we muting all voices of survivors when we refuse to acknowledge what is truly happening? Something that we just did in our safe house here in California is um, we would wake up in the morning and we would do a Bible study with the women. And actually we're going through the book of Esther and it's fascinating to actually look at it from this perspective to see this happened then and we need to talk about it and the women can relate. And after we've been through this, it's a pretty heavy book to take through um, with survivors. We will then do a um, a movement class or a yoga class for them to kind of take this collective trauma to stand in solidarity with what happened with Esther and then to move it through their body. And it's actually a really, really powerful thing to to kind of like couple that with this book and then to then work it out through their bodies after we've been through it. And that's something we've been doing in the mornings, which has been amazing. Um, Many scholars attribute the authorship of Esther to Mordecai. So the fact that this was a man, would he have understood what was what it was really like for Esther to have experienced all this? Did they understand then that what was happening in um, the book of Esther was trafficking? Uh, so I think it's really important that when we um, we are talking about things like this in church, that we we recognize this for what it was. We recognize that sex trafficking was happened then. We recognize that um, even in this story, it was disproportionately black and brown women that were being trafficked, which we're seeing today more than ever. So th- this culture, especially within America, their voices are already being muted. And then you add sex trafficking to that and uh it's really dark to see the results of that. So um, 
something that I have kind of encouraged survivors to look at is how we look at scripture and to kind of just to readdress the narrative that they have grown up with, you know, the way that women are talked about in church is actually really disempowering and kind of just getting that back to the basics and exploring uh, scripture in this way and asking them to interpret scripture through the lens of trauma and how they then understand it and how they understand God has been an incredible journey for the survivors I work with to go through. I know we're running out of time, so I just want to obviously now wrap this all together and, and talk about unmuting through physical fitness and how this all comes together and what I have seen, experienced for myself, and also what I have uh, experienced with the women I work with. So in my research, I came across this beautiful term called the unlanguageability of trauma. So um, for some people, expressing their trauma through words, as we mentioned earlier, is deeply challenging. And for some, it's almost impossible. O'Donnell and Cross call this the unlanguageability of trauma. And because of this, expression and release of emotion via movement of the body could be helpful for survivors. Perry and Winfrey state that, the, that rhythm is essential to a healthy body and a healthy mind. Every person in the world can probably think of something rhythmic that makes them feel better, whether it's walking, swimming, music, dance, the act of moving is rhythmic and it can help to create that mind-body connection. So I um, uh, will, so I work in a gym and um, whilst that is not specifically um, in the context of survivors of trauma, when I walk into a gym, um, I am kind of branded in the gym, I work as the trauma-informed coach. And every client that comes to me now to be trained in just a, an everyday gym is experiencing childhood sexual abuse. They have done the adult survivors or they have they are alcoholics, recovering addicts. And this is just in a gym. So everywhere you go, you walk into um, a place that fitness is happening and the stories that I hear uh, of trauma are just shocking. And so most people who are kind of going into a gym are there to work on their mental health. And I think that when you get to know somebody a little bit deeper, you then find out their, their trauma story. Uh, so um, Nara Kasky, she talks about weightlifting, which is something that I train the women in. It allows for an embodied pathway to healing from trauma. So um, I know that when I um, started weightlifting, because that's my sport, as you can see here on the left, as I started to get stronger, as I started to see the muscles build, as I started to get under these heavy barbells, not only did I feel an ownership and an agency that took back all the things that had ever been taken from me because of my trauma, I also felt the pleasure of God. And I don't know if any of you have seen Chariots of Fire, um, but in that, that movie, he's a runner and he talks about when he... Um, when he runs, he feels the pleasure of God. And that is how I feel when I'm underneath a barbell. And I can almost hear the Lord's voice saying like, that is my girl underneath this heavy barbell, taking back what was stolen from her. Okay. And um, to, to see, to take this to the women who have been told that their bodies are nothing, that they're just a commodity and actually to do this for themselves is, is such an incredible act of um, agency, of empowerment, and um, I just love kind of seeing the transformation that happens with these women. So um, a lot of times we will kind of, we'll see like trauma informed yoga and meditation. And that's been really, really amazing for survivors. I do find that a lot of women that is actually a hard thing to get to because that's just sitting in the body. And when you sit in the body, a lot of all the muted pain will start to come up when when you've just been given the space to do it. And I, so I think like if you're doing something like yoga or something that's really meditative, you need to understand that it's going to be a long, long, long process with survivors because it's really, really scary when you've been through trauma just to sit in the body. So going to something like weightlifting or running, it kind of is like a distraction and like a rhythmic, so you're doing something with your body, which is working through that trauma without you just kind of sitting in it. So there's definitely cases for both. Um, so I was, uh, doing a meditation with one of our women the other day and she kind of, she freaked out and she used humor as a way to escape the feelings that were coming up. 
Um, and she said that it was a strange feeling to be that disconnected to her body. She said it felt foreign after years of disassociation and disconnect. So I think we have to take something like this slow, um, but I think it's worth the effort. And I think that when I, I look at the women, the group of women that I have worked with in this safe house for a year, and I think about when I first started exercising at the very beginning, a lot of them were new into it and how they would, you know, fight against it. This hurts. Are they, I don't want to do this. This is painful. They'd laugh. They'd get out of it and turn them to watch it now. I think of one of the women who's now coming to the gym with me. Now she's graduated from the program and listening to her story and her say that she never, ever thought that she'd be able to connect with the spirit of God in her until she started to take ownership over her body until she started to move it until she started to fill it with healthy food um, and good things and she now feels a connection to her spirituality in a way that she'd never felt before and it is like looking at a new human being uh, and it's been amazing and granted this isn't for everybody I've got still I work with women who are not interested in this at all so it, it might not be for everybody and fitness doesn't even need to be something crazy like getting under a barbell it could simply be walking it could simply be doing some stretching there is something for everybody but it's about getting that brain body connection and feeling a safety within the body <laughs> Hilary McBride says that um, when we are fully connected to the body we understand what it means to be alive and the deeper connection with the body means that um, we're able to kind of connect with that, um, yeah, with the spirit of God. I'm not going to go on to this, I think, because of time. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to kind of bring that all together and just to summarize it. And I'm going to just finish off with a poem and then I'll open it for questions. And I'm sorry that I've gone a little bit over. No, so in no, some <laughs> you've got 20 more minutes. Oh, I do? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll carry on then. <laughs> so, um, so where I'm at now, um, kind of I shared a little bit about my journey and I just wanted to kind of put my story into this a little bit and, and why I believe this is really important. So at the beginning, when I was in college, I um, didn't treat my body well, as I said, I was feeling it I looked at my body with the same way that the, the men who taken something from my body, I just assumed that it was nothing, that it was just good for anybody to take. I had no respect for it. I didn't fill it with good things. I ate poorly. Um, and now to see where I have come and to see as I've kind of gone on this journey of fitness it is so synonymous with how I view God, with how I view myself, that every time I step inside a gym, it feels like an act of worship. It feels like God has given me this beautiful gift. And that's the thing, it's a gift. And I think you have to be really careful with this because like all things, it can cause addiction. Um, and that's something that I have seen as well, is that um, we can introduce this as a tool and it's a beautiful tool. But if anybody has the propensity for addiction, it can be used as a crutch to kind of hide from feelings. So I think we need to be aware of that as well. And there's definitely space to talk about that. Um, but I think for me, like when I go into that gym and like when I look in the mirror now, I see a woman who's been on a journey. I look at God through the lens of trauma still that hasn't changed and the way I view things will be different to someone who has not experienced trauma but I have this richness and this appreciation for my body because it houses the spirit of God in it and before I looked at it as trash and so fitness has allowed me to unmute everything that was put on me it's given me a voice to be able to be bold, to, to, to speak my mind, to be empowered. Um, it's allowed me to do some incredible things. And I, I do believe this can change the world. I, I wholeheartedly believe that this can change the world when you combine the element of spirituality and fitness together. So um, this is an act of self-care for me. It's a non-negotiable. When triggers arise for me as they naturally do, getting in the gym or even just going for a walk, it's where I meet God and it's where I clear my head. I come back to myself and I come back to the core of who Ashley is and all of those things that were taken away from me are restored. I'm fully embodied and present 
And that's it, that the two words that are, are, are really important when you're doing this is the feeling of embodiment and just being present with yourself and with God. Um, and it empowers me to tackle the mountains of life that I'm still wrestling with. So um, the concept of kind of trauma informed fitness, obviously when I do this, I have to be very trauma informed because when you're working with bodies, um, you are working with trauma. And so when you're, you're kind of using fitness as a tool for restoration, you need to recognize that you're creating a sacred space. I see working with every client I do as a sacred space. You're creating a sacred space for someone to share their story and to feel safe. And if somebody doesn't feel safe, they're not going, none of this is going to, it's not going to happen. You're not going to create that safe space for them to have that connection with themselves or with God. Um, and so you kind of, yeah, allowing someone to bring their whole self with their pain and suffering is really important. Believing their story. So when clients are saying that an exercise or a movement is painful, believe them and encourage them to explore the sensation deeper. Encourage ownership, get them to check in with their body, what is coming up. A lot of times when you're moving your body and you hear a survivor say like, that hurts. Actually, sometimes it's actually related to some kind of emotional pain. It isn't necessarily like what is like a painful sensation that's happening in the shoulder. But if they say that you have to believe them because that's their voice, you know, and explore them, invite them to go a little bit deeper, use inclusive language. What are you noticing? Um, I invite you to explore this posture. And I think that's uh, that's really powerful. It's really powerful. So we cannot do the hard work for our clients. This is their journey of taking steps to unmute the pain and trauma that is stored deep within their body. So in summary, meter group theory is a theory created by Shirley and Edwin Arden exploring how marginalized groups are excluded through language by a dominant group and culture. So the process of muting both a survivor's body and voice begins before their trauma uh, by their families, by their traffickers, by anybody that was involved in their trafficking or their sexual trauma experience. But it also continues after when they come back into society and when they go into places that are supposed to be safe. Um, whether that's the church or whether it's the organization that they're working with. And if we don't give them the voice to, ex to express what they need, to express their pain and their sufferings, then the muting happens there too. Um, in our faith-based spaces, we need to be more trauma-informed and allow a survivor to work through their pain and suffering without skipping straight to the praise and gratitude. Moving trauma through the body and releasing it can be helpful for survivors in the healing process. It can be used to unmute the body and work towards healing and creating a space to recognize the image of God within the body. The first step when facilitating the unmuting process with survivors is empowering them by creating a sacred space to hear their story. Now, I'm just going to finish off with a, um, a poem that I think is really um, important because at the start I said that um, whilst so muting can happen by the dominant culture. So um, this can also, what happens is when you see that subtle shift, you end up seeing the person that is muted, muting themselves and they don't realize it's happening. And you see that for a lot of survivors, um, they, they end up, um, when kind of survivors come out of their trafficking, they can end up, the language that they use to speak about other women still in that situation can actually be really, really detrimental. So I always encourage women that like you, it's your job to empower yourself, which then empowers other women who are in that situation. And I think it's really, really um, important for, for survivors to recognize that. So I'll finish off with this poem by Alice Walker. And it is uh, to stop the violence against women. Women, to stop the violence against women, women must stop the violence against herself. We can begin to do this now, now that we see a sky and not a rock, a stick or a fist above all our heads. Woman, to stop the violence against women, stop the violence that you perpetuate against your own sister, who is a woman, your own daughter, who is a woman, your own daughter-in-law, who is a woman, your own mother, who is a woman. Women, stop the violence against women. Stop the violence that lives in opposition to your life deep in your own terrorized and uncherished heart. Women, remember who we are. We're not guys, 
but the mother of all living. We create out of our own blood and milk the creatures who oppress us, whether they are men or ourselves. Women, awake, arise, stand up. Women, to stop the violence against women, get up on your perfectly unbound feet. We have lost the earth living on our knees. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of open this up now for any questions that you might have. Yeah. I, I just have to unpin you so I can see everybody else. Which was I do just to stop sharing? You are stop sharing yeah. screen for a second, and then the, which 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 is um, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. So I'm just giving an announcement that that Rusha can um uh lead the question and answer. But if you're online, if you go down the bottom, there's a reactions button, and you push on that and it says raise hand, and then we can recognize uh you to ask a question. So Great. Um. Uh yeah, let's um, let's open up for questions now. So, is there anyone online that would like to start the discussion? Just raise your hand, and uh, it would be nice if you had your videos on as well. You could see your faces. <laughs> see who's asking the questions. Oh, Mirto. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mirto. Uh, hello. Um, Ashley, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very enlightening. Uh, I really loved it. And I also work with uh, uh, trafficking victims, but I work mostly on the uh, first phase before they are freed. So our ministry is mostly to brothels and the red light district in general. Um, yeah. So it is, uh, it's close to what you're doing and what is uh, mostly, um, what is bothering me is, is the part of listening because it is a very complex, as you know, very complex process. And at the, at the stage that we mostly work with is um, the, the, the voice of the woman is, is uh, very often parroting the voice of the trafficker. So mm. they are still uh, many cases at a stage where they don't know their own voice. They have not recovered it. It's not there. So I would love your advice on how to um, engage in this process of listening and, and finding the voice behind the voice. Mm. Because uh, like I said, on, on this first phase, um, it's... Uh, we don't find the voice of the woman and I don't know if she knows it herself uh, yet. So that is one of my, yeah, one of my questions for now, but I may come back later with more. That is such a good question. Thank you so much. I, yeah, that totally resonated me with when you said that. I think um, when I was in Thailand, I also worked with women who were still kind of active in the sex industry. Um, and a lot of um, it's interesting because a lot of the women that I worked with also became traffickers as well. Um, and so they really did take on the voice of it. And I think it's it's such a long process. And I think we have to be willing to be so patient and not make an assumption of what their voice should be. I think it's so important that we allow them to find that for themselves. And I think that what has been a really huge tool for me is coaching, um, as in like life coaching, coaching, where I will just ask questions and ask questions and ask questions and not assume that I know what the answer is. Um, and I think that it takes a lot of commitment to journey alongside somebody um, and to kind of call out, like, I think there are so many things when I listen to a woman talk about who she is and her hopes and dreams. And I'm, and I'm like, I see so much more for you. I see so much more potential. I see so much more, but I can't tell her that. Like, I can't, you know, like want that more for her than she wants for herself. And so I think it just takes a commitment of, of slow journeying um, and just continue to ask the questions, continue to get her to dream, 
continue to kind of encourage her to to speak, even if it doesn't sound like her voice. And I think eventually it will come when you've created a safe space and when she feels safe to trust you to then explore herself a little bit deeper. But I think it can be so easy to want that for them more than they want for themselves sometimes. So I think it's time and coaching and just continue to ask the questions. But also also challenge as well. Like I think sometimes um, I have to remember that, it, that it's still loving to challenge. Sometimes when a, a, a woman will, we still experience that with women that are working in the safe house. They'll say something that's pretty like um, crass or, and I'm like, do, like, is that, do you believe that? Or is that what you've been told? And it'll like, it's just a simple question of challenge, but actually it will then encourage her to go deeper and to think like, oh, you're right. Like, do where did I get that from? And then they'll take it to therapy and explore it a little bit deeper. So I think like light challenge um, that kind of highlights them to think, oh, I, I actually am not sure where I'm getting that or whose voice that is and getting them to explore it a little bit deeper. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a question in the room uh, from Damon. So go ahead, Damon. Yes, um, thank you for your lecture. Um, when you said, uh, I have the image of God, I mean, I, I thought about it for a long time, but when I applied that sentence to myself, it woke, it woke me up. Mm. No, I'm a theologian, I think, well, well everybody's making an image of God, but when say, I have the image of God, it really woke me up. Um, <laughs> so it's extremely powerful understanding of who we are, and I think the world would be a different world if we acknowledge that yes. I am and you are all made in the image of that understanding can really transform much of the world already. And uh, you also said we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that our, our, our body is precious enough for the Spirit to dwell in us. That's another powerful uh, teaching from the Bible. But also, we are, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are daughters and sons of the Father, and that give us tremendous uh, identity and status. And I think all these resources and truth from the Bible can really help us no matter where we are, how, how, no matter how damaged we are. So, uh, so, so thank you for reminding us of this. So my question is the question of guilt. Mm. Do women feel guilty for for what they have become, uh, even though it may not be really their, their fault. So would they be kind of misled into guilt? And that guilt is very, very heavy. It's a very heavy burden, which is very damaging as well. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I'll just go back as well to your to your first point. I think, do you know, I used to work in the, the red light districts in Thailand and I would walk through and it's funny because a lot of people would come and say like, this is just a dark, dark, dark place. But the way I saw it was full of so much light. And every woman I came into contact with on the in the red light district, I like radiated the image of God, radiated it. And I think like to me, spiritual formation is just transforming and recognizing more and more that image of God that's already in you, that's created in every person. And I think that's just, yeah, I love it when I see a woman come to that recognition. It's it's amazing. But yeah, guilt is guilt and shame. Um, shame is 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 such a powerful tool to stop a woman from stepping into who she really is. Uh, and there are a lot of feelings of guilt. So a lot of our women, because of their um, trafficking experiences, have to do things that they carry a lot of guilt and shame for. Um, and it is, I have seen it wreck women and I've seen it, I've seen women come into our program and then because of that guilt, they've left because they do not feel that they are worthy or deserve to step into their own healing. And it is one of my biggest, like it, it breaks my heart the most because I can't take as much as I want to, I cannot take that guilt away from them. I can't take it away from them. And that is just a, a slow journey of um, of releasing. And I think of 
um, one of our women, she was incarcerated for 30 years before she came to our program because of stuff that she had to do because of her trafficking situation. And um, she has been on a, a big faith journey and she came in so heavy burdened and laid down. And now she's just the most loudest, like beautiful, joyful soul. Um, but that guilt sometimes still sits with her. And I think, again, that like it takes for us just to sit with them in that space. Like I can't absolve that guilt, you know, um, that I'm not I'm not God. And only and I don't even think it's a case of like. I'm very, very slow to say, like, you need to just confess your sins and you'll be forgiven because. I think it, it that we have to be really, really, really careful of that. I think it's I think it's sitting with them. Oh them recognizing that the Holy Spirit is sat with them in this sacred moment and to see like allow God to work in their heart because so much of what happened was not their fault and I think I'm just really conscious of a lot of spaces that survivors have gone into in church where they've said like just fig ask for forgiveness and it'll be gone but actually like they didn't ask for any of that to happen to them and so I think it's just allowing them the space to recognize and say your guilt is, you know, I understand that you have this guilt. It is not for you to carry. Let me carry it with you. But just being careful of the language that we use when we're kind of holding that for them. But it's it's a big. I see it tear women away from our program time and time again. Maybe a sense of forced guilt, you know, we can have forced guilt as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not really true. It's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone is there anyone else online with a question? If not, we'll go to Tom. I'm trying to alternate it a little bit. So I don't I don't see any other hands up. So okay, Tom. Well, thank you, Ashley. Really uh, excellent question. I'm just I'm gonna be thinking about this for a week. I mean, there's so much there. Um one of the things that though was a bit um challenging, and I'd just really like to hear more on that because one of the things you mentioned was sacraments. And that sacrament was in a negative sense of a muting. And one of the things that's interesting about sacraments, it's actually kind of trauma embodied. I mean, in terms of what especially the cup and the bread represent and that kind of thing. And so my question is one, first, how is it off-putting and muting? So give me a little bit of a clue as to why. That is. And two, have you experienced or seen any kind of instances where reimagined and rethought through, especially the physicalness of it and the embodiment of it, could be healing and transformative, or is it just off limits? Best not just to move away from the sacrament. That is a good question, and I actually wish I'd gone a little bit more into this. So, um, when I wrote that, I wrote that in terms of um, the giving of communion bread and wine and so um what I have experienced that that is such a beautiful sacrament that I think has a really really um it's really healing and it's really really powerful so some of our women have said that they find the concept depending on what church you go to and the way that it's done so in um I grew up in an Anglican church and um I know for some women who have received the way it's received is that it will be a man giving it and a woman on her knees taking taking the bread and the wine. And for some that can be survivors who have been trafficked, that can be really triggering for them because it's seen as quite submissive. And like, I can only get this, this food, this spiritual food, if I come to you and you are the one that provides it. So a lot of our women were trafficked within the US um, amongst churches by pastors or by people who are of like spiritual authority. And so they relied on them for their sole kind of purpose of like spiritual filling and physical food. And so that act of like having to receive it from a man has been quite triggering. And so I'm really keen to explore like they still want to participate in that act because it's really beautiful and it's really healing. But what does it look like to be a little bit more trauma informed in the way that we offer it? And obviously I know that not all churches do that, you know, within Baptist churches is a bit more 
um, like within like within the congregation. So what does it just mean knowing that that can be quite triggering the way that we carry ourselves if we're in kind of authority uh, so it doesn't look in a way that's kind of like dominant and, and submissive when we're when we're dealing with with survivors of trauma. Yeah. Any any redemptive examples that you've seen in terms of embodiment? Um. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that I've got any to hand. I know for um a lot like we'll do communion together. Um, and it like when it's so the church that I go to um here in San Diego they they have the it has lots of survivors we have lots of um lots of kind of homeless people lots of survivors of traffic there's a lot of different groups of people and everything is on the same level so we'll have the the pastor or the preacher like it they're kind of like in the congregation so it's all very like level um and and so when they take communion, it's it's those who are within the congregation that will give it to each other. Um, and it has been really healing in that way, knowing that we're all together, we're all the same and we're doing this together. Um, but it would I mean, it just depends on what your thoughts are on 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 leadership and authority and whether we can still make, you know, whether for some survivors they are terrified of that hierarchy so where they would rather be somewhere it was all more leveled but can we can you still have that authority and that leadership and still make it you know really trauma informed and something really beautiful I don't know that's something I need to explore a little bit more thank you thank you good question yeah got a question oh um Okay, can we, can we do salam and then yeah, we'll go to you? Yeah. Okay, salam. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, my organization is working with uh, children and we listen to the story of different children who are abused by different people, even in the church. And one of the challenges, like the other sister said, is listening to their stories and there would be counter transference of emotions as a coach, um, what's your strategy? I mean, you have been through this and now you are listening to the story people. There might be, you know, transference of emotion and anger towards to you. So how are you managing those things? Oh, yeah, <laughs> constantly. So I actually wrote about this in my thesis as one of the challenges that came up for me while I was doing my research. Um, one of the women I worked with, she um, kind of put her, she kind of saw me as her trafficker. She transferred her pain onto me as if I was her trafficker. And it was traumatizing. I am a people person um, and to have that happen really really kind of shook me to the core it doesn't happen a, a whole lot um I do take on I'm an empath as well so I do take on people's emotions really really intensely so I have to I have to be so um protective of my heart but that is actually for me where fitness comes back in so I will be working, you know, nine, 10 hours in a safe house all day with the weight of the world on my shoulders. But then when I step out of here and I go and I, I take an hour for myself to work through not just my own emotions, but everybody else's emotions that are in my body that I have taken on to the act of physical fitness helps to release that for me. Um, and I then just have to kind of lay it at, at like after that, once it's worked through my body, I have to be really intentional that I don't pick it up again. But it has been a discipline. When I first went out to Thailand, I was only 24. So very young, very vulnerable, still kind of fresh out of my own trauma. Um, and I didn't have the tools really to to, to lay that aside. And I, I, I was really burnt out and I had to take a three year break from this work. But going back into it now, um, the like the academic research has actually helped to protect my heart um a lot more but definitely like fitness for me will always be that way that I can I can kind of like protect my own body my own heart and my own mind get back into my spirituality and my body um and just release it so I have to be I have to be so intentional about that self-care but it's hard 
Right. Um, go, go Chun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for your wonderful lecture. And I learned a lot of things. Uh, before I came to the UK, I used to go to a women's detention center mm. where uh, women who used to get involved in illegal sexual industry, they were detained. Mm -hmm. And when I enter into the room that I uh, supposed to meet one person, there was a kind of invisible barrier between me and the lady because I presume that most of the traffickers are male people, men, and um, you know, women are the victims. So um, unfortunately, still many local church leaders and pastors are male. Uh, people, <laughs> men, you know. So in terms of creating a sacred space in a local church context, and can you give any kind of practical tips for male uh, ministers mm. to prepare the space in a kind of peaceful and secure way for them to unmute their voices? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. It's, it's, really, it's tough. I think it's so I think of, you know, a, a lot of our women who go to church now are still very, very wary of men in general um, and male leadership, especially. And so I think first and foremost, it's about acknowledgement that this could be the case and not ig ignoring it. And I think it's language and touch are everything. I think how we carry ourselves, the way that our non-verbals communicate is just as important you know as our as our actual verbals um and i think um always like either not touching or if you're going to touch asking and that's just in you know in in any space when we kind of communicate with humans um and i think churches can be we're very huggy at times but i think making sure like you ask someone like can i can i touch you or what does that look like um but also just being so mindful of the language that we use and making sure that we are giving space for women in churches to use their voices and I think like because and that's the thing I don't think we have to be so careful that we're like women, these women need to see healthy whole men like we can't completely guard them and that's something that we're always like saying to our women is that we need you to work through these triggers because you're not going to be protected from men men are good men are inherently good you have just witnessed and experienced bad men but they can be told that but they need to experience healthy men so i think it's really important that like men that are working in church spaces just ensure that just acknowledge first and foremost that in a church space there will be somebody in there who has experienced trauma, sexual trauma, human trafficking, even if we're not aware. So just always being aware of how you're communicating and how you're carrying yourself, you know, and just making sure that your language is kind, um, that you're still being yourself, that you don't, you know, we have to be careful that we're not always on edge and, but just being really intentional about the kind of inclusive language that we use and just making sure that we understand what it means to be trauma informed. Um, and then the way that you, you know, we communicate scripture and how are we like what what lens are we viewing that through and how are we talking about women when we're preaching from the bible how are we talking about women who were trafficked or you know who were prostitutes in the bible what language are we communicating because women will listen to that and they'll be able to tell like is this person safe based on how they're kind of interpreting what's happened does that make sense so i just think it's an awareness and then how you communicate with your non-verbals and your verbals as well yeah, thank you. Uh, if somebody else doesn't have a question, I'd like to pose one, Ashley, if I may. Hmm. Um, when Edward and Shirley Ardner um, sort of developed muted group theory, um, one of the things that Edwin Ardner noted was that men are also muted. Hmm. And he's speaking from the perspective that he himself was not into sports or physical fitness. And so as a schoolboy, as a, as a young man in college, he felt that he could not fit um, a mold of masculinity. Mm. Now, we've talked about physical fitness and the unmuting of women, but when a man walks into a gym, it's very different. Also, 
Victims of human trafficking, whether sexual or for labor, also includes men. Mm -hmm. So unmuting a man's world in terms of violence done towards them, even in um, sort of marriage partnerships and, and, and uh, abuse of husbands. We know about abuse of wives, but abuse of husbands and abuse of men. And when you talk about physical fitness as unmuting to women, what do you think that unmuting physical fitness and the body of a man that's gone through human trafficking? Could you could you push that out a little bit and or tell me, is there some of that in the center that you're working in? I love this, Ucha. That is a great question. And it's something like there is there is such limited research about survivors of trafficking who are men. And I think so much more needs to be done. So the fitness industry is a funny thing. I think it is um it can be very sexist towards towards women to be skinny to be this that and the other whereas for men it can be very much about aesthetics and muscles and like testosterone and all these things that are kind of um associated with toxic masculinity and so I think when you um I have actually worked with a survivor of of sexual abuse who who was a male and he was one of my clients um and it it's so interesting because he believed that initially coming into fitness was going to he'd always kind of grown up with this chip on his shoulder because of a result of his trauma and he needed to be bigger he needed to be stronger he needed to be more powerful so that was his why behind kind of entering into fitness and actually as we started to work together the same principles applied for as they do for women it's about embodiment and it's still about taking away everything that you've been taught about fitness and aesthetics and doing this for that mind-body connection for that mental stimulation so the same principles apply you just need to destruct a slightly different narrative that has been told about men and even in my gym today like I just think like you know we like women are expected to lift more than men and there there is this narrative about being bigger faster stronger so when you have a survivor of trafficking whether they're male or female you need to approach it with a gentleness but it's so important to recognize that they're coming in with a whole host of different messages that they have been told um and you know it's still like stripping all that away and getting them to see that what you're doing is still going to release trauma through your body. You don't need to pile on loads and loads and loads and loads of weight. We need to strip it back and kind of address the ego a little bit. And that ego is there because that's what they're told that they need to, to do. So I think, yeah, the same principles apply. It just, and the same when I'm working with a man, I will still say, can I touch you? Like I'll still use the same language that I will use with women that will not change. I'll still be respectful and trauma informed and kind but they have just received years of of different messaging that women have received that is just as damaging that we need to address. Thank you. Anybody else, any other questions? Well, that's a further question in, in whether you're doing this or not, but it just seems like so much of what you said would be so empowering to young men and women um, who are coming up. So before you know, when they're coming into their college years and that kind of thing to kind of get it through different embodiments to get in touch with their bodies and to feel good about that. Because, you know, it's those vulnerabilities that have begun early that then blossom into making one much more susceptible. So do you know of anything that's going on like that with uh, especially young women who be in their in when they're in their youth and coming into kind of discovering themselves to help build that tie between their soul and their body together and seeing how they grow together. I don't know, and I would like to know more because do you know I think back to if I'd have had this going into college, because college was my was my downfall, it was the first time I was fully away and I hadn't processed my trauma until I got to college. And it was, and that's when it all just went a bit wrong. I think if someone had shown this to me, but also I think growing up in church, 
the so the the way I was taught was that the soul and the body really were quite separate, and that you're 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 trying to just attain this level of spirituality you know your soul goes to heaven it's all about your soul and your spirit and your body doesn't matter the body is bad the flesh is bad and that's something I mm-hmm. like a little bit in my thesis and I think that was the messaging I had received in youth group it you know there was a lot of shame-based teaching on on sex and relationships so it was just separate and I tried to keep it very very separate when I was growing up and I think if someone had come to me whether it had been in while I was in sports before going to college or even in my church youth groups, that there was this connectedness of the two um, and, you know, had kind of introduced me to exploring God through the means of my body because I'm such a bodily person. It's just the way that I've been created. Like I, I experience emotions through my body. And if I had known about this from a younger age, you know, maybe it could have been so helpful. And I would love to explore that with people who are kind of like in their teens. Um, and I'm I'm just wondering what the result could be. I'm, I'm really interested to see who's doing what in that area. Maybe it's a PhD. It is. It is. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? No, Riyadh. Riyadh. Riyadh, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ashley. I just want to, my question was actually what you have just been uh, saying about the separation between the mind and the body, and then you brought the soul within. So, and as 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 we look at uh, theology, it's it's kind of very Western theology to separate the body and the mind or the spirit or the soul. My question is this: uh, Did you find any difference when you were? Uh, dealing with survivors in Thailand, so they don't have this mentality, their mentality is different. Did it make any difference in their healing process that they, they don't have this problem of separation, they're already their culture, or it's 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 similar uh, dichotomy between both, or how did you find this, if you can share a bit about this? Uh... Oh, that's great. Hmm. Definitely, definitely a difference. I, well, yes and no, because funnily enough, so this is interesting because I worked with an organization, a missions organization in Thailand, all their spirituality was Western. So all the Thai Christians I knew had adopted a Western evangelical spirituality. And so there was no difference. So I'm actually really curious is if if I was to go back and actually, I potentially might be going back to do some work for a, for a little bit just to launch a project. And I'm really curious to see working with Thais who've not had that, um, who've not been converted necessarily by kind of Western missionaries to see. But when I've worked with ones who are Buddhist, interestingly enough, who haven't adopted a Christian faith, they are so much more comfortable with being in their bodies and exploring their spirituality through like like yoga and meditation they can do that but the the western thai christian still very very separate isn't that interesting yeah, yeah so I'm just just more. sounds like a phd Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a phd He's in the process <laughs> does anybody else have any other questions no we're trying to get them all yeah yeah <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Um, I'd just like to say that this is Ashley's very first lecture. She finished her master's degree um, in spiritual formation wow. quite recently. Um, I supervised her dissertation and um, it was brilliant. Um, she got a distinction and I was wow. just so challenged by the way she wrote and seeing her develop. Um, and her unmuting, not only in this physical fitness, but also she sat in, the when she was sitting in the classroom the first time, watching the beginning of her academic unmuting. Wow. Okay. Um, and it, and it, was, it was a real joy to see her, because so much of her trauma occurred when she was in college and then she dropped out of college and then she came back to, to a different college. Mm-hmm. But she sat as a student in my class, in my lectures, and I could see 
the beginnings of her unmuting. Mm -hmm. And so there is something to be said for this physical fitness, but also for the academia. Um, and I'm really hoping that part of this process of unmuting these victims of human trafficking will also bring them to the possibility of doing some academic studies because that has also been taken away from them mm. and made they've been made to feel unworthy in every aspect of their life, not just their body, but also in their intellect. Mm. So I look forward to hearing more uh, of what Ashley's doing. And you've held your own today, Ashley, with a room full of PhD students. So well done. Yeah. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being given the time and the space to, to speak. Thank you. Excellent. Wow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>